I went to the doctor. Hopefully, to those listening, this doesn't sound like a big deal. Big whoop, a doctor visit. But to me, it was huge. See, I haven't had insurance in about a decade. It's always been something I wanted, but I've been focused on building my career in filmmaking, which isn't cheap. And every year as I'm weighing all of the options, there's always been something that got in the way. A camera breaks, a move across the country, needing a new mattress, or the car breaks down, some credit card debt that needs attention. There's always something, right? And it's much easier to make excuses and to put things off for some reason or another. So this year, whoa, baby, I made up for it by getting the gold plan for both me and my wife. It's extremely expensive, but it's been a while for both of us. So I thought go hard for a year, get everything checked, and then maybe we can bump down to bronze next year and save some major cash. So anyway, I found myself a doctor, you know, since I hadn't been to one since switching coasts. And a few days after, I got a phone call to discuss my blood work. And it didn't go as expected. In fact, I wasn't prepared for this at all. My voice was calm, my heart was racing, and it felt like my vision was slowly irising shut like the opening to a James Bond movie. This phone call introduced a new element to my life, one that has had me struggling with anxiety and depression and guilt for the past three weeks. But it's nothing I can't overcome. Let's talk. or back in school. We'll see where the world goes with mental health, I guess, because that's always been my my passion. But that's a little about me. Biology and psychology, those are your two focuses of study? Yep, yeah. On to the biology. Can you tell us a little bit about your bleeding disorder? Describe, you know, what it is and, and how does it show up in your life? What is it like living with your bleeding disorder? So I have von Willebrand's type three, and it's, it prevents the blood from clotting. Basically, I was born without um, an enzyme. My liver doesn't make it. And it carries one of the factors to the clotting site as well as holds the platelets together. And I don't make any of those. This is an interview with Michelle from season one of Flow, a podcast from Bloodstream Media. Flow is straight talk about extreme periods and often features people living with VWD and I don't make any of those. There's varying degrees. So being type three, I don't make any, like less than 1%. There's also type two and different degrees of that that makes different moderations of it. And then type one, which is a little bit more mild, but also has some pretty severe, can have some pretty severe side effects. Um, uh, my kids were all supposed to be type ones genetic wise. We had genetic testing done and I actually have a type two daughter and a type one son. So kind of like a full blended family here going on. <laughs> so it's quite a complex disease. All the different types can have varying um, bleeding symptoms, type three being more severe myself. Yeah. Um, but I also know some type ones and twos that women, especially when we go through um, puberty, starting your periods and childbirth and things like that, that's when you run into, we all have pretty much really bad bleeding issues across the board doesn't matter your severity type three is different in that since there's no von willebrand factor it never carries any of your factor eight protein to the site of injury where it needs a clot and so in that effect you can have a lot of similar symptoms to hemophilia in terms of i get some joint bleeding muscle bleeding just kind of random internal bleeding i've had gi bleeds like in my stomach for spontaneous reasons, you know, normal people often will get small leaks in their, in their capillaries or bumps and bruises, and they're able to clap. But with von Willebrand's, it's either very delayed or with type three, maybe not at all. So we have to use replacement therapies, which actually, uh, people who donate plasma, I have, uh, basically human plasma in my fridge here at home that we, I just reconstitute with saline and I'm able to administer that via Venus or I have a port now that I got three years ago. I know from speaking with innumerable people living with bleeding disorders over the past 10 years of doing this work that a diagnosis like this can be a lot to deal with, especially if you have children with varying levels of the disorder as well. And I can only imagine the mental toll this might take on a person. When my doctor's office called to talk me through my blood work, I was in a meeting. I stepped into my office real quick and shut the door to take the call, telling everyone I'd be back in about a minute. 
The nurse on the other end stated quickly and efficiently, Mr. Bragg, we got your blood work back, and Dr. A is seeing that you have extremely high blood pressure, borderline pre-diabetic, and we'd like to put you on a medication to help you lower your blood pressure in addition to some dietary changes and rigorous exercise. No more fried food, no more burgers. We suggest a lot of fish and vegetables and doing 45 minutes to an hour of cardio four to five times a week to get your heart rate above 150. Do you have any questions? Nope. Thank you very much. I said, and I hung up the phone and went back to my meeting where I sat in shock until it was over. Me? High blood pressure? I'm only 37. And sure, I've gained about 40 pounds since the beginning of the pandemic, but extremely high? Extremely? That doesn't sound like a word a doctor should use unless things were, you know, critical. Well, to paraphrase a line from Stephen King's book, It, I was feeling a shortness of breath the gosh darn aspirator wouldn't touch because that shortness of breath wasn't in my throat or in my lungs. It was around my heart. This was the feeling of anxiety kicking in and it did not feel good. While it is well understood that individuals with von Willebrand disease will experience a variety of bleeding episodes throughout their lifetime, the psychological impact of these symptoms has received relatively little inquiry. Greater knowledge of these impacts could help inform and support potential mental health screening efforts for VWD patients at U.S. hemophilia treatment centers. This is the voice of Kay, my co-host on the upcoming Bloodstream Media podcast, The PV Pod, Stories from the Marrow. Say hi, Kay. Hey. (laughs) Kay is reading from an article published by the National Hemophilia Foundation on February 8th about the rates of depression and anxiety experienced by people living with von Willebrand disease. The results, which were published in the Journal of Hemophilia, showed that a relatively high proportion of the participants met the criteria for both depression and anxiety, with rates at 63.6% and 58.3%, respectively. Several variables were strongly associated with depression in adults, including most prominently joint problems. Being single, divorced, widowed, or separated were also linked to depression in adult participants, promoting the authors to emphasize the value of a strong support network for individuals with VWD. In addition, participants aged 12 to 17 were more likely to have anxiety. The authors described this as a time when adolescents with VWD begin a slow transition to adulthood, wherein they gradually take greater ownership of their own care. This is a process that will naturally prompt some stressful situations, even under the best of circumstances. The authors posit that findings such as these should be impetus for enhanced mental health screenings with VWD patients at HTCs. Did you know that the impetus for starting the Let's Talk project, first as a documentary and then continuing as this podcast segment, was a notable lack of communication and awareness around mental health issues amongst those living with bleeding disorders? Mental health in general is something that previous generations were taught to ignore. People going through mental struggles were thought to be crazy, hysterical, weak. But we know better now. Talking is a catalyst for healing. So what did I do when I found out that my blood pressure was extremely high? Well, I immediately messaged my wife. And though I had several more meetings that day, I took a little bit of time to take a walk to call back the doctor, ask a few more questions, like, what is the medication? I spoke to my wife and let her know exactly how it was feeling and everything the doctor said, that I was scared, that I was embarrassed, that I was feeling guilty because I knew for the past two years I'd been overeating and overdrinking, and I wanted to stop, but I just didn't. Courtney reminded me that life has its ups and downs, good times and hard times, and that I had already begun to make changes. I joined the YMCA in January. I also gave up drinking alcohol over 80 days ago now, and I've been eating healthier. And most of all, she reminded me that I can handle this, that we can handle this together. So now I'm on my medication, I'm on my path to physical wellness, and while this one conversation didn't solve my problems, it created a safe space to bring up how I'm feeling on both my good days and my bad. I've also noticed since drastically changing my eating habits and exercise routine that I'm more routinely happy overall. So many of our mental and physical challenges are linked in the most unexpected ways. It's like my contractor who fixed the leak in our kitchen says, leaks are weird. The water may be coming out under the windows, but the source could be just about anywhere. Thank you to Michelle and the production teams over at Flow and the PV Pod Stories from the Marrow for contributing to this segment. And to Amy and Patrick for giving me a space to talk about these things. Talking can be so healing. 
If you're on your own mental health journey and you don't know where to begin, check out letstalkmh.com and click resources. For the foreseeable future, I'll be watching my cholesterol and exercising and taking my medication and focusing on positive thoughts and sharing, lots of sharing, including with you. So let's talk next month and I'll let you know where I'm at. And before we go back to Patrick and Amy, I'll leave you today with one last snippet from Michelle on that same episode of Flow that I played earlier. You typically have to really advocate for yourselves, especially as a woman, because a lot of doctors are taught that only men can have bleeding disorders like hemophilia. And then also within families, women often say, oh, women in our family bleed heavy. We are just heavy bleeders. No, 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 no. Don't listen to your mom. Don't listen to your grandma. Don't listen to your aunt. If your body and your heart and your mind is saying this doesn't seem right, this doesn't feel right, just go seek multiple opinions. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> we're clapping. We're sending you hugs. <laughs> we're, yes. <laughs> that is the message every woman needs to hear about a, periods or anything related to your bodies.